We're going to get started. There's a lot of familiar faces I'm seeing uh, on my screen, people from UVA, but also a bunch of people from farther afield. So that's great, power of technology. Um, first, before we begin, let me just thank the IHGC, the Institute for the Humanities and Global Cultures at UVA, and the Department of French for co-sponsoring this event. And Gilliam, Isabel Ostertag, and the rest of the superb team at the IHGC were indispensable for making this happen. So thanks, guys. So it's my great pleasure to present my colleague and friend, Ed Welch, Carnegie Professor of French at the University of Aberdeen. As many of you know, Ed is a scholar of modern and contemporary France. After his undergrad and grad studies at Oxford, Ed published his first monograph on writer and intellectual Francois Mauriac in 2006. Since then, his interest has shifted to more contemporary writers like André Nakin, Annie Arnaud, Michel Houellebecq, and Jean Rollin, just to name a few. While he often writes about literature, Ed is also one of our field's most active cultural historians, having spearheaded a number of projects that explore how France has confronted, lived through, and responded to what he calls the twin dramas of modernization and decolonization. Two edited volumes that engage with this topic are the 2013 book, Contesting Views, The Visual Economy of France in Algeria, co-edited with Joe McGonigal, and more recently, France in Flux, Space, Territory, and Contemporary Culture, co-edited with me and published in 2019. Ed has also made a major mark through his work on contemporary visual culture, photography in particular. He regularly reviews exhibits for the art press, has collaborated on photographic essays with artists, has edited volumes on photographic theory and photography in its publics, and in a more recent series of essays on Raymond de Pardon and the Mission Photographique de la Data from the 1980s, Ed has explored the role that the medium has played and continues to play in the collective imaging and imagining of France near the end of the 20th century and into the first few decades of the 21st. Ed is currently at work on a new book that looks at the discursive origins and cultural responses to the phenomenon of aménagement du territoire in post-war France. His talk today, which is excerpted from that manuscript, is entitled Spatial Planning's Time Machine, Spaces of Speed in a Modernized France. Please join me in welcoming in real or virtual claps, as you wish, Professor Edward Welch. Uh, gosh, thank you, Ari. Thanks Get very away. much. Thank you, thank you, Ari. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. That was a, that, that was a very generous introduction um, th and very, very, very kind of you. And uh, thanks also very much for the invitation to, to join you um, today as part of your, your series. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to, uh, to, to, to be with you, albeit virtually. But one of the advantages of, of, of this new way of working, of course, is that we are able to welcome and to, 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 to have people with us from, from all over, from, from further afield. And it's great to see um, people have taken time out from their Friday mornings or afternoons um, to, um, to, to, to come along. So, so hello and, 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 and welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, I, hope, I, hope, I hope the next hour or so is worth your while. Um, I've got a, a slide, I've, I'm, I've gone lean on, uh, I've gone lean on my PowerPoints uh, for this talk. Um, in fact, there is just one. Um, which I, you'll, you'll be will be accompanying you throughout what I'm going to say. Um, and the, the reason the reason be, there's a methodological reason for that that I'll, I'll kind of maybe kind of uh, talk about sort of briefly in a couple of minutes. Um, as Ari said, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is, is extracted from a, a book uh, project that I've been working on that is actually almost finished now, um, which has been long in gestation. Uh, and, and explores um, the whole question of uh, aménagement du territoire, so spatial and territorial planning, um, particularly in the post-war period, um, really kind of kicking off in the 1950s, but then exploring its ramifications through to the present day. And what I'm interested in, in, that, in looking at in, the, in that project is precisely um, how discourses, um, but also activities of spatial planning um, take shape uh, within post-war France, um, but then also thinking about the outcomes that they produce, the outcomes of that spatial um, planning project, um, uh, the very real tangible physical outcomes, particularly as they're manifested in uh, various forms of infrastructure, things like the new towns and so on and so forth, but then also how these new environments and these consequences of spatial planning um, begin to be uh, explored, manifested, articulated, challenged, critiqued, depicted across a, a range of, of, of literary and visual culture. So um, 
the aim of the paper today really it, it it's it, it kind of gives a sense gives a flavor of what i've been trying to do with the with with the material uh, and some of the stories that i'm trying to tell in relation to the material um and it kind of describes an arc really what i'm talking about today beginning in the kind of the 1960s and, and going through into the 1980s but I suppose at one level, it's a kind of snapshot or it's a kind of an X-ray of the kinds of ways I've been trying to approach the question, which I guess does bring me to the kind of the, 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 the sort of the methodological um, approach that, that's reflected, or I don't know, is maybe kind of manifested in, in, in the slide. So you, you're just going to see this slide um, and I'm going to very kind of talk my way around the slide as the, as, as the, as the talk unfolds. Um, but but what that hopefully kind of reflects is is, is the, uh, the the my attempts to kind of bring into dialogue um, a, a whole set of different cultural forms and the expressions of of, of, of modernization as a process and outcome. And I'm I'm a great I'm a, I'm a, I, very, I very much kind of go along with the idea the Benjaminian idea of the, the image constellation and and I, I think working with um, constellations of images and seeing what happens when you bring them together is one of the most productive, one of the most exciting ways of working. Um, and 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 uh, hopefully, as we as the talk progresses, you'll 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 begin to sort of follow me in some of the the, the connections and the lines that that one can draw between the various things that we see on the screen. Um, so so that, if you like, is the kind of the methodological reasoning behind. Um, what what you're seeing on the screen and 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 the 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 material I'm going to present is, I suppose, relative. It, it, you know, it's relatively schematic in terms of um, the the kind of the the, the outlines or the, or the, the the arguments that I'm going to put forward. And obviously, they can be unpacked further. But I think one of the natures of the topic is it's a beast of a topic, and um, one of the challenges of the project has been trying to. Uh, to manage uh, uh, what is basically a, a pretty much a, uh, an infinite um, range of material produced by spatial planning and that in itself I think is quite telling. So um, I'm really also going to be focusing for the moment on um, the, 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 the period beginning in the 1960s so, so that if, if you like the era of high Gaulism um, when uh, during the presidency of Charles de Gaulle, I'm, I, I guess most of us will know that being between 58 and 69, 1958, 1969, um, France's look and feel began to be transformed by an extensive programme of spatial planning and modernisation or aménagement du territoire. And what makes, I would argue, what makes post-war spatial planning so interesting, in particular during its high Gaullist period, is that it's a technical and administrative project that's also political, ideological, moral, and philosophical. So there's, there's loads going on, um, as you might imagine, at this uh, historical juncture in, uh, in, in, in France. Now, unfolding over the subsequent decades, Aménagement du Territoire produced new towns, particularly around Paris. It produced holiday resorts, particularly on the south coast. It produced motorways, airports, rapid transit uh, rail networks, the RER, uh, and other forms of infrastructure. So lots of space was made and lots of space was transformed during this period. But while modernised space was the most obvious outcome of the work of the planners, um, the aménageurs were perhaps even more preoccupied with time. And more specifically, they were obsessed with the future and driven by a belief that spatial planning could create the future in the present. So one of the things that kind of draw, drew me into this project is, is precisely this fact that what we see today when we go to France, when we travel around it, we're living with and through the manifestations of an extensive period of, 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 of aménagement, um, physical manifestations, spatial manifestations. But what's going on there is a working through of some sort of temporal anxiety or temporal preoccupation that that, 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 that is kind of, that takes physical form through different forms of infrastructure space. Now, writing in 1965, this is your first quotation on the slide, Olivier Guichard, the so-called Gaullist baron, le baron du Gaullisme, uh, and also direct by of, of the then new Datar, the Delegation, uh, l'aménagement du territoire et à l'action régionale, um, so the data spl uh, spatial, spl uh, spatial planning agency, not spatial planning agency, uh, which was created in 1963, he suggested that l'aménagement ne vit pas dans l'époque présent. 
il doit toujours la devancer, projeter sur l'avenir. He was writing that in Aménager la France, uh, which was, uh, uh, I, don't know, I don't know the extent to which Olivier contributed to the writing of it, but certainly it was his kind of programmatic account of spatial planning, Aménagement du territoire in, uh, in, in France, written just two years after he'd taken over as the head of the data. So being ahead of its time, planning's job was to return to the present with insights from the future and use them to propel the country towards its destiny. Now, there was an immediate and obvious, blindingly obvious political context and motivation for this flight into the future. Um, and it's captured in Kristen's Ross, Kristen Ross's image of France slamming shut the door. That's a quotation from her book, Fast, Fast Cars, Clean Bodies, slamming shut the door on the colonial era after the Algerian war and also reflected in the rise during the 1960s of the hexagon as a figure for metropolitan France, uh, one which more or less advertently acknowledged the country's post-colonial reconfiguration and rescaling as a European nation. Uh, and I think that's kind of captured quite nicely in the, the top left-hand corner image, uh, which is taken from Aménage de la France. I'll come back to the image in more detail shortly. Um, spatial planning, therefore, as a political project was a means of reasserting France's place in the world after decolonization by demonstrating its technical prowess as an advanced civilization. And a word in terms of positioning the project, I and mean, Kristen Ross um, has long been an inspiration for the kinds of things, uh, kinds of work I've done and, and, and the kinds of things I've explored. And, and I, the book, my book, dialogues a lot and draws on a lot the, her, her work in Fast Cars, Clean Bodies, which I think is an exemplary um, sort of uh, interdisciplinary and, and, and cultural studies approach to, to post war France. Um, but I guess another important reference point is probably Paul Rabinow's um, French Modern. Uh, looking at the whole project of modernity as it takes shape through the 19th century and into the 20th century. And of course, he's very alert there to um, the whole processes of architecture and spatial planning, and particularly the colonial projects of Lyoti in, in, in Morocco, for example, and, 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 and how they play themselves out in terms of France's um, project of modernity and slash as uh, uh, colonization. At the same time, the planner's fixation with the future, notwithstanding the political imperative for it, was fed by some striking philosophies of time and history. And it was informed in particular by the ideas of philosopher Gaston Berger, whose notion of la prospective as anticipatory thinking would guide their work during the 1960s and early 1970s. And prospecting the future could inform action in the present and orient the country more effectively towards that future. But doing so was all the more vital when that action was predicated on Berger's particular conception of progress. Now, Gaston Berger, he's not massively well known um, in, in French kind of history, French cultural history, but I think he's a very interesting figure. So he was a phenomenal, phenomenologist, a phenomenologist by training. He founded the uh, journal Etude Philosophique in 1928. Become, it will become one of France's major academic journals of philosophy. In uh, 1953, he becomes the director of higher education at the Ministry of Education in France. And in that role, he was instrumental in establishing the École uh, des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales and also the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme, uh, working with Lucien Febvre and Fernand uh, Brodel, so the two big um, Annals School historians. Um, he also met an untimely and quite striking end in 1960. Uh, when he died in a car crash on the Auto du Sud, um, south of Paris. That's to say, as Fernand Brodel put it in an obituary notice um, shortly afterwards, he died dans un paysage ultra moderne, pareil à ceux dont il s'acharnait à découvrir le visage. So uh, he was a philosopher, he was a thinker of perspective, of the, of, of the perspective uh, approach. Um, he argued that um, prospective anticipatory thinking was all, or above all a question of attitude, uh, an attitude prospective. I, I I'm not going to go into that whole question here in, in much more detail. Suffice to say that that idea of embodying an attitude, a kind of way of being in the world is precisely the sorts of things you, thing you can see being played out in the discourses and actions of the aménageur over the course of the 1960s, bound up as they are within the whole kind of Gaulish programme of 
uh, of French modernization and, and grandeur. And, and central to Berger's prospective thinking was an assumption not just of human progress, but of the accelerating rate of that progress. And it was by, by embracing the principle of acceleration at work in human endeavor, argued Berger, that humanity could evolve ever more quickly in a virtuous circle of accelerating change. The more we progress, the more we invent, and the quicker our inventions enable us to progress into the future. The more, to, the more quickly too, of course, we can leave the past behind. And that sense of leaving the past behind is very much articulated in some of the other writing that, that, that key figures of the time, are, key planners of the time are, are, are producing, people like Pierre Massé, who was head of the Commissariat, Commissariat General du Plan. So he was basically France's head planner. There's an interesting kind of link here um, between Berger's notion of prospective thinking and his sense of um, progress as acceleration with um, the kind of the techno-Christianity of Teilhard de Chardin, um, who was also lurking in the background as one of the, 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 the reference points for a lot of the, a lot of the, 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 the people at the modernizing avant-garde in um, the, French, uh, the French administrative um, fraction in particular. And again, I'm not going to talk much more about that now, but, but that's something maybe we, we can explore and it kind of taps into that whole uh, kind of influence of progressive Catholicism coming through um, Dominic and, Les and Esprit and, and, and that group of intellectuals and administrators who are kind of connected and embedded within the modernizing project. So the planners drive for the future found its most obvious practical expression in the preoccupation with circulation, flow and time spent. Spatial planning opened up the way to the future by making better use of time through improved efficiency of speed and movement. Hence the emphasis placed on transport infrastructure, motorways, ring roads, RER, airports, in Gaullist, uh, in Gaullist aménagement. It offered neat confirmation of Paul Virilio's argument in Vitesse Politique, 1977, so decade or so after this whole process was really starting to kind of gear in, um, that it was through prosecuting a quote unquote war of time, that's to say through technical innovation in the domain of speed, that the West hoped to maintain its economic and civilizational superiority in a post-colonial world, or uh, as Virilio puts it in slightly more lapidary terms, la vitesse, et l'espoir de l'Occident. And of course he italicizes that sentence in his book, uh, Vitesse Politique, just so we get the point. So looking at it from that point of view, spatial planning can be seen as a machine designed to shrink the French hexagon by engineering time-space compression. Uh, the route to economic expansion lay through squeezing space and accelerating movement around it. And Guichard spells this out visually in that illustration in the 1965 book Aménager la France that I just referred to a few moments ago. Um, as the head of Datar, it was his job to engineer the contraction of the hexagon. I mean, very often we kind of, one of the, one of the big developments of the notion of time space compression comes out of David Harvey's work, particularly 1989, Condition of Postmodernity. But it's quite interesting that um, back in 65, Guichard had this map of France being shrunk by uh, advancing uh, technological improvement. So his narrative was around the development of the railways, sort of so road to rail. Uh, and then in the caption to this illustration in the book, particularly to the Aerotrain, Jean Bertin's Aerotrain, uh, that was, was, was in development at around the same time. And, and at that point, uh, the assumption was that these, the Aerotrain, this kind of hover train, uh, would be the main, the main um, transport uh, innovation that would enable um, time space compression in uh, a kind of a modernized France. Um, the Aerotrain would reach speeds of up to 400 kph on elevated concrete tracks running across the country. Uh, but spiraling costs, delays and politics meant that the project would get no further than a prototype line built in the countryside north of Orléans. And indeed, um, the line, many of you probably know this, the, the line's still there, at least the kind of the prototype track is still there. Um, and, and it re-emerges, resurfaces on occasion in, in, in kind of projects which explore um, French, post-war French modernity as a kind of a fossil or as a legacy or as a ghost or as a kind of a, a lost object. 
Um, so, I mean, Ari will know this, that in um, uh, one of the big photo projects from the 2010s, the France Territoire Liquide project, uh, one of the contributors to that um, takes time to photograph and explore the, the remnants of the Bertin Aerotrain project uh, around, uh, around to the south of Orléans. But uh, suffice to say that in, when Guichard was writing, the assumption was that the Aerotrain will be the way of the future. However, because of those problems, the snags that it encountered, uh, until the TGV came along in 1981, autos, so motorways or freeways for our American friends, um, would be the most visible, at least I think, I think that's what freeways are in, in, in the States, uh, would be the most visible infrastructural manifestation of France's acceleration into the future. In 1972, after a spell at the Ministry of Education, in Georges Pompidou's first government, Olivier Guichard was reshuffled into a more familiar portfolio, uh, becoming the Minister for Equipement and, Amage and Aménagement du Territoire. Uh, and shortly afterwards, the erstwhile director of the Datar took to the wheel of his Citroën, Citroën DS as part of a promotional film by his new ministry about the quote unquote vital necessity, necessity, necessity vitale of motorways for the country's development. Um, while the Datar published a report into the country's Grand Liaison Routière, mapping out how they unfolded across the country in a striking echo of the illustration of Guichard's books. That's the image you have in the bottom left-hand corner, which is extracted from this Datar uh, report. The two images in the, middle of the, uh, in the middle of the slide are stills from that promotional film. Um, and... Uh, I think if there's one image that kind of sums up this whole project and the whole kind of sense that's driving it, it, it is it is Guichard in his DS in the fast lane of this kind of brand new stretch of motorway. Um, you know, he, here is the future. Here is the future um, expressed in visual form uh, and material form and physical form as Guichard powers down the motorway. Uh, in the right-hand image, we, we, the, 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 the camera, we, we switch to an, into, uh, an inter, inside shot of the car where with Guichard um, as he's kind of barreling down the motorway just to go, go in and do a sign. Um, and interestingly, he says, this is bad about it, interestingly, he says at this point, oh, yeah, no, um, uh, we, we, we don't, we're not going to have speed limits on these motorways, you know, times of the essence, we're not going to have speed limits, who needs speed limits? Um, well, then suffice to say that like a year later, they brought in speed limits when they realised that that having people hurtling down the motorway wasn't necessarily a kind of a, a, a good approach to health and safety. So, but at the time, the idea of uh, the, 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 the fact that he signalled that these were unlimited spaces or spaces of unlimited speed, um, I think really kind of communi communicated that sense that they were the, the physical means by which uh, France's um, time, space, time, space, or impression was, was being enacted. Now, it's not so much that uh, motorways were, in, were a new addition to the French territory. The Auto, the auto de l'Ouest, um, heading out from Paris towards Normandy and modelled on the German autobahn, had been built in the 1930s, while the construction of the Auto du Sud began in 1953. Um, and uh, the first section uh, out of Paris opened in 1960, which kind of made Gaston Berger one of its earliest victims, it has to be said. Um, what mattered now was the role that Autoroute had been given in galvanizing French modernization. Driving at speed down a long stretch of glistening tarmac, uh, Guichard reported that the rate of construction of the motorways was accelerating all the time. And by the end of 1978, he said, this is 1972, it would reach about 800 kilometers a year. So nearly equivalent to the distance between Paris and Marseille. And in many ways, the quickening expansion of the motorway system seemed to make material the promise of spatial planning as a means of accelerating the country into the future. And at the same time, motorways could produce new forms of beauty through their inscription in the land. Um, so uh, the, the, the voiceover commentary in this film says at one point, ces longs et larges rubans, symboles du futur, doivent être le mariage heureux uh, des paysages naturels et artificiels du passé et de l'avenir. So they enabled advancement towards the future in their role as speed space, while the forms they took 
enacted modernity in the landscape. Um, and their beauty lay in their manufactured quality, their ability to combine nature and artifice as they worked with and through the folds of the land and opened up new perspectives over it. Um, th this film's available, the, 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 uh, the French Ministry of Urbanism has got an interesting archive of loads of material from the post-war period and, 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 and earlier actually, um, sort of commercial films, kind of ministry films, but also some documentaries and things uh, exploring kind of various aspects of, of French space. Um, you, can, you can Google it. And come across it fairly straightforwardly, and this is one of the films that they've put on that on that archive, and it's a good it's a good one to explore, and, and it has some very kind of I think quite potent and telling images of that kind of moment of of, of French modernity. What I'm going to do now for the remaining few minutes is just kind of um, shift optic a little bit and think about what happens as time as the 70s and 80s goes on and how um, these landscapes these speed spaces begin to kind of manifest themselves and emerge into French culture and when when they when motorways do percolate into French culture as they do increasingly during the 1970s late 1970s and into the 1980s um, they seem to encapsulate modernity as an, an epochal shift in perception knowledge and sense of being and providing uh, provide a fitting environment for altered states of consciousness. And hence, I think why Gaston Berger's untimely end on the motorway in 1960 seemed oddly prescient of the future that he was seeking out. So, for example, Jean-Patrick Manchette's crime thriller, Le Petit Bleu de la Côte d'Ouest, 1976, um, is bookended by its protagonist, Georges Gerfaux, uh, circulating Paris on the Boulevard Périphérique, opened in 1974, in his Mercedes, as he listens to West Coast jazz. The ring road is empty, apart from a few lorries trundling along and some cars going way beyond the speed limit. Many drivers are drunk, the narrator tells us, including Jaffou, who's also taken barbiturates. This is three in the morning. It's probably a time not to be on the périphérique, I would imagine. Um, that he's doing so, the narrator tell us, tells us, he's not connected with the drama of murder, kidnapping and pursuit with which he'd recently been embroiled. It indicates simply that Georges est de son temps et aussi de son espace. In 1982, uh, Julio uh, Cortazar and, and Carol Dunlop undertook a month long journey down the motorway from Paris to Marseille in their camper van. Um, their trip related in Les Autonautes de la Cosme Route, uh, 1983. That's, the, um, uh, that's the, 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 the blue and green image uh, in the center of the, the screen at the bottom. Um, their trip was against the rules and norms of motorway travel. Rather than using it as the quickest means of movement between two points, they slowed and stretched their journey by visiting every rest area. They stayed within the precincts of the motorway for the duration of the trip in contravention of the regulation limiting time spent on the motorway to 48 hours, as the toll tickets they lose, quote unquote, on the way make clear. So at one level, their challenge to the regulations and the philosophy of the motorway can be seen as a form of resistance, um, an interrogation of the motorway's functional drive as a speed space. However, taking their time is not simply or necessarily a gesture of defiance. What their slowness helps to do is to accentu accentuate the peculiarities of the space of the motorway and its odd relationship to the rest of the territory, most notably the empty quarters and rural backwaters through which it cuts and which abut the fences lining its route. Slowness becomes a way of getting to know the space better, understanding how it works and how it shapes our being. As they suggest, motorways produce altered states as much as being a place where they find expression. In Les Autonautes de la Cosmo Route, they home in on the motorway as a space engineered to produce certain effects and behaviours by maximising efficiency and reducing distraction. Like Manchette, they're alert to how it produces a new sort of consciousness in doing so. The long ribbon of asphalt, and that you get a sense of this from the cover image on the, on, on the book uh, from the, 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 the edition published in 82. The long ribbon of asphalt they, they photograph from footbridges or rest areas appears as the essence of space-time as it unspools to the horizon, a material expression of time in space that enables the most rapid and efficient movement between point A and point B. 
it forms a total environment that absorbs and funnels everything into a vertiginous sense of pure speed and an unencumbered becoming. The sensation it produces is not unpleasant, admits Dunlop, but potentially fatal. The motorway is a place of absolutes where death can come quickly, and perhaps this explains its lure for Manchette's drunken drivers as they circulate the boulevard périphérique like satellites around a planet. Now, the motorway makes one of its most striking cinematic appearances, I'd suggest, in the closing minutes of Agnès Varda's classic Sans Toi ni Loi from 1985. Indeed, throughout the film, modernised landscapes emerge as a quiet but defining backdrop for Mona's journey through southern France. They tend only to be glimpsed, often obliquely, but nevertheless at significant moments. Right at the start, for example, in the wing mirror of a truck that picks Mona up from the side of the road, the camera catches sight of one of the pyramidal apartment blocks in the 1970s holiday resort of La Grande Motte on the coast near Montpellier. In the closing minutes of the film, as Mona stumbles towards the camera, this is a, this is a, a, a screenshot from, from those closing minutes on the bottom right hand corner, and the ditch in which we know she will die, because we've seen it happen at the start of the film, bracket spoiler alert, um, she's caught between two horizontal lines. In the foreground is the drainage pipe over which she will stumble and fall. In the background run the twin carriages of a motorway along which vehicles speed through the shot. At one level, these traces of infrastructure could be seen as little more than reality effects or accidents of location shooting rather than anything meaningful. Nevertheless, by incorporating them, and in particular by framing Mona's final movements between the elements of infrastructure and spatial regulation, the film is articulating a relationship between two ways of being in space and time. To a large extent, the closing scene re reconfirms what the whole film has been about, the fact that Mona does not fit in, that she exists in and opens up spaces parallel to the regulated world of social normality. Uh, at the same time, Mona's presence and movement can't but help but give meaning to the motorway and what it represents. It's that it perhaps stands most obviously for the regulated world and dominant modes of being from which Mona has removed herself. This is the world she calls of Le Petit Chef de Bureau, for example. Yet to a degree, the film's closing minutes bring into dialogue two ways of being in time, which are both in their own way, strange and distinctive, and which are expressed in differing forms of movement in the scene. If we notice the motorway as more than a dark gray line in the background, and if my curse, my curse is not working, um, it's because of the horizontal rush of traffic along it, whose flowing speed contrasts with Mona's stumbling footbound movement away from it through the vines and towards the camera. The disjunction of the two captures the tension produced by the space time of the motorway as it cuts through the territory, especially when it is rural or agricultural and moving at a different rhythm and pace. So for all that Guichard's promotional film in 72 proposed motorways as something that could hyphenate the present and the past as they flowed over the territory, the evidence was clear that they articulated precisely the break or rupture with the past that had been lurking as a more or less acknowledged desire of France's project of post-colonial modernization. It was clear as well that they were also initiating and bound up in a reconfigured socio-economic space-time with its own distinctive forms and qualities. In the early 1990s, and here I'm sort of edging towards my, con well, not edging, I'm getting towards my conclusion. In fact, I'm about to arrive there fairly quickly. Um, in the early 1990s, the anthropologist Marc Auger would coin a resonant term for uh, forms such as this. His notion of non-lieu recognized and gave consistency to the sense that there was something qualitatively different, both uh, qualitatively different about the nature of much of the space in France at the end of the 20th century, something that resembled, to use his famous term, a sort of super modernity. That sense had been finding different expressions in cultural form during the 1970s and 1980s. And in, in, in the book, I, I spend quite a lot of time thinking about 
um, some of the manifestations of this in, 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 in films and literature from, from the centuries through the 80s and thinking about Buffet, uh, Buffet Froid, Bertrand uh, Buffet, Buffet Froid, for example. So um, where we're at um, La Défense and then we are at, uh, where you know, it starts at La Défense, it ends um, on a, a, a man-made lake uh, in a dammed lake in the Alps. Um, so there's a whole kind of thing of, of kind of uh, kind of uh, being bound up within these modernized spaces. The work of Eric Homer, uh, not just L'Ami de mon ami, it's Sergi Pontoise, but also his documentary series of films in the 1970s around the Ville Nouvelle and the birth of Sergi Pontoise. So th th there's a there's a beginnings of a kind of coming to coming to consciousness of this kind of modernized modernized space in French culture, and, and how it's seen, how it's perceived. So that sense of, 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 of different space had been finding different expressions in cultural form during the 70s and 80s, as we've seen, as French space underwent some substantial and radical transformations. At the same time, manifestations of supermodernity, of course, existed in ever starker contrast with France's marginalised urban peripheries, themselves a legacy of the country's modernising urge, where time and space had appeared, had appeared to stall. And they also found a different form of configuration in the kind of peri-urban space that also began to emerge and impinge on consciousness in this kind of early 90s period. Uh, and uh, one of the films that I look at, which I think captures that quite nicely, is uh, Malik Shiban's Hexagon, um, which kind of brings together all these kind of spatial moments. It's a film that is, is, is set in and explores the life of a, a grand ensemble of a cité, uh, Goussainville, uh, to the north of Paris. But Goussainville is also on the periphery of Charles de Gaulle, Rassi Charles de Gaulle, um, and indeed uh, Goussainville village was abandoned in 74 because of the, uh, because of it lay under the flight path of, of Rassi Charles de Gaulle. Uh, and, and Rassi Charles de Gaulle airport kind of embodies, it's almost like the last great manifestation of, of, of that kind of Gaullist moment of, of modernity uh, as, a, as, a, as a kind of uh, an expression of modernity and infrastructure as, uh, as, as drivers and, and, and motive forces for circulation, for movement, for flow, for, the, for a kind of productive, uh, a productive um, force of, uh, of galvanizing the productive energies of the economy as, as a way to ensure France's progress into the future. So. Uh, the, the, by the by the early 1990s not only are we beginning to see a kind of a, a coming to terms a coming to a, a reckoning with these spaces of French modernity but they're also coexisting with these other outcomes of that whole modernizing process and existing in this peculiar kind of dialogue which is really uh, one of the things that that that, that, that we, we continue to explore and to grapple with as the 1990s unfolds and moves into the early uh, the early noughties and into the 2010s, and, and we can see that the very much the, um, the, uh, the 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 events around uh, the Gilets Jaunes protests in in 2018 uh, and the commandeering of roundabouts, but also the 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 the, 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 the occupation of the uh, uh, Notre Dame des Landes um, Zad uh, by the Zadist. Um, in uh, the late 2000s as part and parcel of this ongoing negotiation with um, spaces of modernity and modernization in post-war France. Um, but uh, to borrow an expression, um, all that really is another story. Uh, Ari, I'll stop there. Great, thanks so much, Ed. Uh, maybe if you turn off the screen share, that way people we can start a conversation more readily see everyone. Thanks so much for, for a super rich uh, and super engaging uh, talk. I, I think your I think your your lean PowerPoint is is almost more illustrative uh, than had you shown twenty five images film clips. Um, I think your talk also really did a good job sort of wetting our appetite for the book to come. So that's that's uh, that's great. We'll be really excited to read it. I've got all sorts of questions sort of floating around in my head. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the aero train more about the sort of ruins of this, you know, uh, uh, modernist, but modernist sort of utopian ideal of transport. Your talk also makes me think a lot uh, when you're talking about the roadways um, about what they replace, right? And I'm thinking of those Godard films, Breathless, Weekend, 
where all of the travel between places like Paris and Marseille happened on the Route Nationale, notably the Nationale 7, uh, and how that sort of becomes replaced by these by these new motorways and 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 their and their their beauty, I guess, is the, the quote you you cited. Um, there's also something that 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 I, I, I want to hear you talk about a little bit more, which is this idea that what we start to see in the 90s also are people really questioning what's happening to the environment um, at the hands of all this modernization. Right? There's that colloquium, Francois Dagonet published a book in 93 called La Mort du Paysage, where they talk precisely about the sort of negative effects uh, of all this construction on the very idea of, of landscape. Um, so these are not questions, they're kind of comments, thoughts, you know, streams of consciousness arising, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Now, later, if other people have questions, feel free to jump in, raise your hand. I see Oliver Davis, I guess I'll moderate this, Oliver Davis. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Ed, I think it's a really fascinating topic. I'm not sure everyone would think it's a really fascinating topic, but I'm really looking forward to, to the book. Um, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about the political dimension that you that you alluded to at the beginning, um, uh, you know, that this kind of high Gaullist modernization project was also a political project. I mean, is it is it that all technocratic projects it, try to squeeze out real politics is that is that the political story or is there something else going on there uh, oh that's, that's that's an excellent question um that's an excellent question okay the the, the answer is being very long so i'll, I'll try to so stop me if i'm boring you um and i don't i'd also as i was giving, giving the paper i thought god this just sounds like a bit like i'm some sort of train spotter or something doesn't it you know nothing, nothing wrong with train spotting at all on the contrary but i know what you mean in terms of is, is this would this appeal to everybody? I'm not entirely sure. Um, okay, so um, the, the politics of aménagement. Well, you, you, how, there are various ways we can take this, and um, the first way <laughs> would be would be, the, and then you know I'm, I'm not innovating when I propose when I suggest this line of argument. The first way would be around the ways in which um, there is pe people like uh, uh, Delphine Dulon have written quite a lot about this. Uh, Christian Ross talks about it as well about the ways in which the kind of, if you like, the technocratic class, the administrators, the kind of the, 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 the that, that kind of modernizing administrative um, fraction in post-war France sets out to impose um, rational, rational technocracy as um, the model of excellence, if you like. I'm sounding a little bit Bourdieuian, but, but, but the, the line of analysis I think is quite helpful. So one of the, one of the political debates, if you like, that's happening in the 50s, um, and it's happening, you know, in different sorts of circles, including, for example, in places like Express, you know, and the kind of the modernizing, the, the, the modernizing kind of left, uh, sort of left of centerish centrist um, uh, media. Is that um, you know one of the ways in which you solve the political problems of France is by handing power to the technocrat to, to, to you know to, to the to the to the 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 enlightened technocrat basically you know it's that old argument so in a way one of the politi one of the political lines is the fact that we do away with you know that that we, we need to find a way to democratize um, the uh, the the ascendancy of the technocrat to put it very very kind of like briefly and, and crudely. So, so there's that whole debate going on around the um, the, the, the importance and the and the political value of uh, of rationalist administration, and the and the imposition of that model uh, within um, the, the French kind of political sphere. Uh, line of line of analysis number one, line of analysis number two would be you know this idea of Gaulle's grandeur and 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 the fact that we you know we have a post-colonial France, we have a post-imperial France. And again, I'm you know I'm not in, innovating on this, but if you like, it's the, it's a development of the the Henri Lefebvre line about internal colonization, and 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 it, it's it's the kind of it's the fact of um, the the fact that a, a lot of the people involved in implementing spatial planning um, were you know engineers who had been trained at the Pont des Chaussées who were coming back from the colonies. They were coming back from Mali and, and Mauritania and obviously Algeria. Uh, and, and, and North Africa, and they were bringing back that kind of 
not just that expertise, but also that way of thinking and that way of re relating to the territory that had that had been exported out to the colonies. So um, you've got that sense of an internal an internal colonization, post imperial internal colonization, that is the means through which you know French grandeur can be articulated through 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 a kind of a, an even development of the country. And this is the Gisha. This is the point of the Datar. Datar is about um, equal. Uh, the, the uh, equal development of the uh, equal development of the whole territory um, and that is a political project you know it's definitely a political project um, so it's kind of an internal political project uh, you know of taking it on a step further uh, you know we're talking about neutralizing the the, 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 the French Communist Party and, and the, 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 their claims to legitimacy um, but it's also that kind of sense of, sense of rayon, uh, rayonnement you know it's 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 tra it's, it's, it's re Reconfiguring rayonnement from the colonial era to the to the, the post-imperial era, uh, and making France this kind of beacon of beacon of Western civilization. Um, so, two two or three kind of ways in which you can understand it, I guess. And there are there are others as well. Uh, but, but thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Jen, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, thank you. At first. Um, Thank you for this really super interesting paper, and I apologize for the construction noise in the background here. It's quite, quite <laughs> fitting, you might say. Not too bad, but yeah, appropriate to the to the day. Um, so my first question, I think you actually just kind of um, answered a little bit directly, was about the the framing of this as kind of a, a context of of the post colonial and the ways in which you know that that might artificially separate the colonial and the post colonial and overshadow some of those very direct ties to colonial modernization projects that you were just talking about, but also the, the kind of the, the continuing relationships with the, the colonies and, and people with roots in the colonies in many of the spaces that are um, so kind of tied to, to the, the modernization projects. You know, so many of them are, are very directly inhabited, used, you know, impacted by, um, those folks. Um, but the, the other question that I had was about resistance. Um, and, and I'm thinking here about like research that I've done on Nayi sur Seine, where the, the mayor, longtime mayor from 47 to the early 1980s, um, you know, one of his main tasks, even though he was an elephant of the, the Gaulist party, was to keep all of this modernizing infrastructure out of Nayi sur Seine and to displace it into the working class, very non-white suburbs adjacent to it. So to, to keep the panif out, keep the RER out, um, you know, make sure you're only building expensive office space as opposed to um, you know, public housing and, and cité. So, so do you see that kind of resistance in other places and how are there other ideas about space and time that are put forward by, by those who are opposing it? Right, yeah, and, and you know, I mean, so th this this kind of follows on quite nicely from, from from Oliver's question because th this is another way in which you know this is another way in which politics manifests itself. So you've you've got modernization, you've got Gaullist aménagement as a kind of political project, um, uh, and then and then you've got uh, and then you've got that fascinating thing about what happens basically when the, the planning idea or the planning dream meets meets reality on the ground so, and you get political resistance i mean it, it's almost like a kind of you know it's almost like an experiment in what happens when when, when you get a kind of an imagined project being, being translated into reality into physical reality on the ground and yes you absolutely get uh political resistance and and, and that that kind of uh, that manifests itself in different ways in different contexts um so you, you're right you've got uh, I, I mean maybe just kind of step back a, a minute uh, alongside the stuff that I've been talking about here. So the infrastructural developments through the data, so the motorways and things in parallel, of course, is running the, the work done in and around Paris um, led by Paul de Louvrier, uh, the schema directeur d'aménagement et d'urbanisme de, de la région de Paris, um, launched in 65. Uh, and de Louvrier, of, of course, and again, many of you will know this, um, had previously been before he took over as the as the um, delegate general for the for the Paris region, had been in Algeria as the delegate general in in, in, in Algeria in 58, 58 to sixty, and actually as part of that had been responsible for implementing the Plan de Constantine, 
which was the kind of the last the last attempt to to to, to kind of neutralize the uh, Algerian independence through modernization. So you've, you've you, you so so very so, so the question of Parisian modernization and Paris region modernization is being played out in these different kind of contexts. So you've got the if you like the urban periphery places like Neuilly, where you've got as you say very long standing mayors who are who are putting up kind of local political resistance with, with greater or lesser kind of uh, effect, and then you've got the kind of the more rural periphery. Um, where you've got landowners and agricultural and, 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 and agriculteurs um, who are who are finding their land being acquisitioned, being expropriated, being bought up for the development of the new towns. So you get those same sorts of debates being played out. So there's lots of lots of political negotiation on the ground between Delouvrier and his uh, team, and and the kind of the the attempts to fend off. The, um, the the arrival of the developers. So if you think of a so so um, Eric Gourmet's film uh, Enfance d'une ville, um, which is which is 70, which is nineteen seventy five, which is a portrait of or it's a documentary about the creation of Sergi Pontoise, is it, excellent. It's really really good on that kind of local political kind of um, negotiation. Now it, it, it's it's fair to say that most of the resistance took the form of trying to make it not happen there kind of thing. Um, because of course you've got that whole kind of sense. I mean, you know, one of the reasons why the, uh, the um, Romer's film is so good is because he stages precisely that um, contact between the local politician, the l'élu uh, of, of a communal level, of the level of the commune, uh, and the kind of, uh, and um, Bernard Hirsch, who was the, was the director of the Sergi Pontoise new town. And you get that sense of that central uh, central power arriving and, and, and coming into contact with the local, uh, with the local uh, elected representative and, 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 the, and the struggle that happens, the resistance that emerges. Not entirely always successful, it has to be said, in terms of fending them off, but then it becomes that process of negotiation and deliberation. And I think that's what's interesting. What, what, what I would say, one of the things that, that, that I, that, that's, that's been quite kind of interesting to explore in the book is the fact that um, one of the, if I was to take issue with Kristen Ross, say, in her analysis of some of this, it's that she, and other, you know, Lefebvre does it as well, is that there is this, this assumption of this kind of monolithic top down imposition. You know, power's working from just kind of, it's just coming down and these new towns are arriving. But I, I think what's interesting is the fact that, you, you, you know, there is that power dynamic that's in play uh, and there's that whole kind of exercise of power by the state. But at the same time, what I think what that misses out is the fact that, uh, you know, this is an encounter between individuals on the ground. Uh, and, and those kind of local negotiations and those local political disputes are really how you see those kind of political tensions embodied. And, and those dialogues having to happen. Um, and, and so the res resistance takes the form of, 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 it happens in different locations in different ways, but ultimately it is this resistance of the local elected representative against central authority. Suffice to say that most of the time central authority, not always, but central, central authority often wins. I think that answers your question, but maybe it doesn't. <laughs> Patrick, French. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I haven't really thought this question through fully, and that'll probably become evident. But um, you talked about how the uh, Ed, thank you for your talk, by the way. Talked about how that the how the the discourse around the aménagement du territoire was intended to, through time space compression, increase the amount of time that could be spent. <clears throat> and and <clears throat> you also talked about how. Part of the rhetoric was about France realizing its destiny and reasserting its place in the world. But I suppose my question is about what, in the discourse of people like Guichard and the ministry and the government, and so on. What what did they what do they say that they want time to be spent on? Um, what I mean by that is what you know, apart aside from the the representation of this process of modernization, what is the what is do they talk about what is happening at the level of production let's say at the material level of of what it's going to enable in terms of production or consumption and that kind of aspect does that make right. sense it, 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 it absolutely does yeah it absolutely does um and well i mean one, one of the one of the figure 
who I, I think is very is germane to this debate would be um, Jean Forastier, who um, was one of the, I mean, you know, he's part of that modernizing avant-garde, uh, economist uh, by, by training, uh, but also a kind of a popularizing kind of economist, popularizing, popularizer of, of modernization. And, you, you know, the, the um, so the, oh, I think I'm already off on a tangent. But anyway, um, one reference point for this, for this whole process, the, one of the inevitable reference points, of course, is the United States. The United States as the kind of the emblematic advanced civilization uh, Forastier, one of Forastier's books is the, the 40,000 Hours, uh, which is really, um, this is a book about um, productivity, really. And, and it's precisely this. It's like, you know, arguing that uh, one of the, one of the uh, great outcomes of um, increased efficiency and modernization in production um, is um, a, a, a massive increase in um, if freeing up of time and particularly leisure time. Okay, so so it's, it's, it, we're, we're really in the kind of the idea of a leisure economy here. So it's all that kind of conversation in the 60s, uh, people like Crozier around uh, around the idea of a, of a, of a, of a leisure a, a leisure economy and a, a, and a consumer economy. So the idea that um, the amount of work needing to be done would reduce uh, and that would free up people to have um, extra leisure time. Um, so it's a kind of an improvement of the human condition. And I guess if you like, I suppose, you know, thinking about thinking within a kind of Cold War context, you know, if 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 um, if capitalism as manifested under Gaulism can promise uh, can, can promise a kind of a, a leisure society, then um, the, the 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 promises being made um, across the way by by the Communist Party kind of um, start to be sort of um, neutralized, I guess, would be would be one of the macro level political things going on here. So it's about it's about a leisure society. Um, th there's a lot of interesting uh, there's a lot of interesting reflection on what uh, what uh, what the future will look like, and they become particularly keen on 1985. Um, so in, in 1964, um, Pierre Massé, who's the, um, the, the 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 French master planner. Um, got a group together to reflect on life in 1985, and they produced this, this pamphlet, this kind of document called Réflexion pour uh, 1985. Um, and they, they project forward what, what life would be like and, 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 and emphasize the fact that there will be more, more time for leisure, more time for pleasure, more time for leisure activity. And actually this links, us, this links me back to one of Ari's questions around the environment. And one of the one of the ways in which they kind of conceptualize that is by ensuring that within the space of the territory, there are national parks and spaces of leisure and pleasure, you know, wild spaces that are obviously kind of super regulated wild spaces. Um, so so that, that's, the, that's the overall paradigm, the idea of a leisure society. But what's interesting is that they're at the same time a bit kind of anxious around some of the consequences of this modernized France, because they, one of the things they, they, they fear might happen um, because of the environments being created, there's an increase in psychological problems uh, and, and, the, and, and the, the psychical impact of modernization, and particularly in the form of depression. And they're very keen, they're, they're very alert to the fact that, 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 that because, of, because modernization is going to happen so quickly, and because the, the, the pesky French population aren't very good at adapting to things, which is the other rhetoric at the time, you know, they're just like, they just, they're not like the Americans. The Americans are really good because they've, you know, the, na the nature of space in America means that people are always moving all over. You know, it's a vast territory and they've, they've broke, they've, they've, they've gone pioneering away, whereas the French just like to stay in their corner. Um, but because of that, because of that kind of psychological limitation of the French population, that they will find this move into an accelerated future um, psychologically quite challenging. And, and, and one of the symptoms of that will be depression. So they're mindful of that, quite interestingly. And of course, you know, when you fast forward into the 70s and 80s, la crise is all about, it's often, you know, it's a psychical crisis as much as anything else. Um, so so the, the promises of, um, the promises of, of, of a leisure society, but the, there's a kind of dark shadow to that, which is the idea that people might not be able to adapt as well as they, as, as they hope they will. Uh, and I think you can see that being played out around about something like Serge Pontoise 
Um, and you can see, for example, Romer's film, uh, L'Ami de mon ami, as an exploration of that, both in terms of the ideal, you know, the modernizing ideals having come to pass, uh, but also um, in, in some of the things that we don't see or some of the things we know happening at the time, the kind of the real lived consequences of modernization for a large chunk of the population. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's a society of leisure, but, uh, but, but not without consequences, I would say. Thanks. Uh, Peter Weston was next in line. There we go. Now we got everything to work. Um, thank you very much for, for your talk. Um, as someone who lived through that era, um, driving around France in 70 to 75 with my parents, completed as autoroute, and now I study automobility, I never really considered, and I'm sorry about the lighting here, I never really considered the, uh, the framework of what you were talking about. So, and I apologize, I came in a bit late, so you may have already answered this, but what inspired you to take on this particular project? Uh, well, thank, thank you for the question. Um, it's a good question. Okay, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a project of very long gestation, it has to be said. I mean, I started with this, I started working on this too long ago to say, really. Um, the, 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 so, so, so the root of it, actually, the, 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 the penny dropped, if you like, um, in, when I was reading um, sort of late 90s, I, I read for the first time Les Passagers, Les Passagers du Rassier Express by François Maspero. Uh, and that's a you know, French people in French and Francophone studies will, I would imagine, be quite familiar with that book. It, and and it, is, it, it became a very well known book as an exploration of French space. If you're not familiar with it, uh, please stop me if you are. If you're not familiar with it, um, then it, it's written by uh, François Maspero, who was a, 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 um, a left wing publisher in the 1960s. But, uh, he ran Maspero Publishing House, who published some of the some of the key kind of uh, militant literature of the 60s and, 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 and uh, people like François Fanon and so on and so forth, um, who also became a writer. And he undertook this journey with a, with a photographer friend. They started at Wassi de Gaulle Airport and they traveled the RERB. Uh, and they got off at every stop, apart from the ones in central Paris. And, and uh, he does a kind of a transect, if you like, across uh, across the Paris region through that journey. Uh, and, and that kind of spoke to me partly because it's just a great book in terms of a, as a piece of kind of um, investigative documentary writing. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's very, very evocative. And at the time, I was spending quite a lot of time in and around Paris and was familiar with that, that, that kind of the bon lieu and those the areas he was traveling through. But it was also, um, I felt that whenever, whenever the book was talked about, there was, a, there was a bit of the story that was missing. And it was that sense of where do these spaces come from? You know, why do we have these spaces? Why do they take the form they have? How did these spaces come to be? Uh, and what do they mean in the history of post-war France? And so once you, uh, and once you start unpicking that story, and it's a story of Paul de Louvre and the Chimé Directeur, for one, you begin to realise the enormous kind of um, duration of this project. You know, this is a decades-long project that's actually still ongoing. You know, I mean, uh, post-war aménagement is still a process, you know, the, the Grand Paris um, it's just the latest iteration of this kind of, of this of this whole process. So once you start un unpicking that, you begin to see how, um, you know, this was something that was really kind of happening across a massive scale. And lots of these kinds of little kind of cultural emergencies, em em emergence, uh, these manifestations. So whether it's a text, you know, writing by a person like somebody like Jean Rollin, uh, whether it's a film by Eric Romer, writing by Annie Arnaud, um, some of the photography projects that, 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 that kind of emerge in the 80s and 90s, they're all responding to this thing that's happening, but it's almost like the thing's too big to see. So I guess that was one of the, 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 the starting points of the project, is trying to understand what it is that people are reacting to. The fact that these environments are so embedded in daily life that you don't always see them, or if you do see them, you don't think about them. But actually, when you stand back to look at them, they're kind of they're kind of, it's kind of a, it's, it, it's, a, it's a weird thing, you know, it's a weird thing, it's a strange environment. Uh, and it's, it's, there's also, I'd say, something quite, quite specifically French about it as well, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's a very French project. I mean, obviously, loads of 
all you know all the Western European countries went through a period of post-war reconstruction and modernization. But I'd argue for reasons that I probably couldn't always articulate that there's something quite specifically French about the manifestation it took within France as a kind of a sort of a total system, I suppose, or an attempt to create a total system. Thank you for the question. It really gets asked, actually. It's a good question. You are. Um, thanks for your talk, Ed. Great to um, have you here at UVA. Um, I wanted to maybe, um, my question will maybe echo some of the thoughts that have previously emerged, but I'm really interested in the comments you made early on about the degree to which belatedness is kind of inherent in this projective thinking and how you might um, how you might or might not want to read that um, sense of the belatedness that's expressed in the failure of the Ariotan project to, to actually materialize into um, the, the, you know, the, 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 the vast infrastructure that it's imagined to become in relationship to what you know, we're seen as a kind of systematic sublimation of the colonial project redirected in new ways. Um, and, and I guess maybe I'd, maybe if I could, I mean, you're free to answer it in any way that you want, but I'm really just struck by the incessant visualization through the map of these projects that are incessantly bounded by the boundaries of France but that those images are so much a, just a re-articulation of a long-standing mapping of France and this um, project of centralized infrastructure whose ends always intended to extend into the empire. So part of my question is about like how you might read those that mapping as actually revealing this kind of project of sublimating the continuity of a well-established imperial project. And especially if in fact, the infrastructure that's being constructed that you so vividly bring into view through looking at this range of, of, of visual and other kinds of media is really just reiterating the roots of the railroad. <laughs> um, so what does the map, like what are these auto routes connecting to? And how is the imaginary of this new, new infrastructure in fact, visualized in ways that 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 insist on a boundedness that actually is <laughs> not at all what's happening because those auto routes are in fact tied to a system of ports to a system of airplanes that are far from national um I, I realize there are like five questions or comments in there, so feel free to take, you know, whichever or none of them that, that strikes your fancy. Yeah, no, no, thank, thank you. Gosh. Um, OK, hmm. so let's have a think about this. Let's have a think about this. Where, 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 where I'll start, actually, is your observation uh, around, around the insistent visual, visualization of it. Which, which I think is, which I think is key, um, and I think is really important. And, and one of the things that I try to foreground in the book is the, the, the sheer volume of material that is produced by the planners. I mean, you know, they're, they're writing text, they're writing stuff about all this. You know, there's, there's I mean, Massé writes endless books about planning, um, as do other people. But, but actually, um, one of the most striking things is the ways in which it, it finds expression in visual form through maps, map, maps as a tool, you know, that they used, obviously they use, they use cartography as a tool, as a, as a visual tool, as a kind of a, a visual a tool of visualization, as a tool of kind of territorial command. Um, 
but there are also there are also there are also expressions of dreams and wishes and and and, and, Im and imagined places and imagined futures uh, and i was really trying to kind of uh, what i tried to do is kind of really bring out the sense of that that kind of in incredible kind of richness which is kind of discursive but also iconographic as they try to kind of visualize what these landscapes look like so i would absolutely kind of um I, I'd absolutely kind of uh, agree with you around, uh, sort of share your kind of emphasis on the uh, the, the the kind of the intense visualization of it. Um, now, in in terms of in terms of what that means and how you read it, one of the one of the ways to think it through that, that I found quite interesting was was particularly in relation to Paris. I'm going to come back to all the motorways in a minute. Um, but what the, the, the Chemin Directeur that I mentioned, the, the Delouvrier project in 65, um, really understood one of the things about that project that it tried to do was, was understand um, that the Paris region as a, as a, into, into, as had a dynamic sense of the Paris region within the national territory, but also it, the broad context it began to think about wasn't so much the colonists, because of course that wasn't, that wasn't really going to fly, but Europe, so the European space was the ways in which, um, so France was, 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 was insistently bounded, okay, throughout a lot of the material, the, the, the Guichard book is very good, on giving a sense of the insistently bounded nature of the hexagon, you know, this, uh, and the reader would have been confronted all the way through the book. The reader's confronted with the he with hexagonal France. Okay, Corsica Bay is barely visualised. Certainly, no, you know, by that stage there were the Dom Toms, you know, still in existence. You, you didn't hear anything about the Dom Toms, um, so it was very much kind of a hexagonal bounded France. But at the same time, when they were thinking about Paris, they were also thinking about how it was going to it was going to connect in with the European community, which, of course, France had joined in 57, signed up to the Treaty of Rome 57. And they were beginning to think about the fact that the bounded France was nevertheless going to be within a context of a European space. And so circulation and flow within the European space was one of the things that they were kind of thinking about how France would be engineered into. So that's where the sense of, the, if you like, the currents, the currents and the flows are being redirected. Yeah, they're, they're kind of, um, they're, they're, they're being, so, so one of the reasons they were, they were keen to develop the, 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 the kind of the Mediterranean seaboard was, was because of those kind of flows of traffic going between Italy and, uh, Italy and Spain uh, across Southern France. So there was that, I think there was a redirection of the flows into a kind of a European space. One of the ways that manifests itself, particularly in relation to the Schéma Directeur, is the fact that the, 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 the political work they needed to do when they were drawing up the Schéma Directeur was to um, displace a previous planning project, which uh, this is, this is uh, acronym-tastic, was the PADOG. So the, the, I won't bore you with the PADOG, but suffice to say the PADOG was a long-standing attempt to control the growth of Paris, and it did it by just kind of putting a ring around Paris Paris region saying there'll be no more urban development beyond this beyond this line. Okay, it literally was it was a, it was a ring drawn on the map, pretty much. Um, so it was very much Paris. Paris is a bounded space, and it was it was very much a map that was about uh, about kind of uh, disciplining the growth of Paris, if you like, rather than regulating the growth of Paris. So the the Chemadier, it's a switch was was was, was, was it took away that that ring, took away that boundedness. And, and, and understood Paris much more, it imagined it along the river, the, the valley of the river Seine. So it imagined it, they called it a ligne de force. Um, you know, this idea of a kind of a, a dynamic kind of, a, a dynamic force line, if you like, running along the Seine Valley that took you to La Havre and therefore out to the Atlantic, but then also took you through the through the rivers down towards the, the Rhine and the Rhone and, on, and onwards and then, and then over to the west, over to the east. So that I think was how they began to kind of reconfigure the lines of linear de force, lines of force, um, in terms of the boundedness of France, but still visualizing France as a bounded space. I think for all those political reasons, um, does that go some way to um, engaging with some of the some of the really interesting points that you brought up? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Maya, time for one or two more. Thank you uh, for this uh, fascinating uh, presentation. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, 
I came a little bit late and hopefully I didn't miss something, but I was stuck by the quotation with, uh, with your slide. Uh, and if I remember, it's, it says something like, l'aménagement du territoire se doit d'être en avance. It's like this duty or uh, this, um, uh, the projection to the future is supposed to be what we are going to be in the future. Uh, then this idea of a future that's foreseen from the present. And I'm, I'm stuck by this because we know that all these projects around the 70s and 80s in France, the l'aménagement du territoire is put in question. It's a, it's a failure. It's a social uh, failure and, and it's redone. Um, between parentheses, this projection into the future, être en avance, uh, maybe I'm not quoting it right, but it was a very positive um, vision of the future. This positive vision of the future is well represented in the different movies you talked about. One of them that was at some point mentioned by Ari Abut Souffle, I think about playtime, where we see this France uh, adopting modernity in a very positive way. Even though the personage, um, Monsieur Hulot, is not really at ease in this new uh, France. But that, that being said, the reality of this project, of this aménagement du territoire, as it was conceived in the colonies and, and transferred to France in the 70s, um, is a failure. And is, is there somewhere in your project where you think about? this about what are we doing now with this past trying to reorganize it and it, it's it's just it's it's visible everywhere in France that we are re-questioning the banlieue re-questioning these boundaries around the different big cities uh in a way that's much more fluid allowing for much more flow and just I want to hear you about where are we standing now with this France that was designed in the 70s and the 80s. Yeah, no, that's that's that, that's uh, that that's that's a, that's a that's a good point. I mean, I, mean, I think and I think I think that's that, going going back to the, the the kind of the question of the kind of what what drew me to the project. I think that's also one of the kind of the, the key things that that I find particularly kind of powerful about this kind of activity. It's the fact that it, it, it's it's of such long duration. So the environments that are created, places like Sergi Pontoise, uh, to name one of the new towns, uh, Evry, to, to name another, the place you know the, the, these kind of these attempts to create the future in the present in the 1970s, they persist into the they persist they, they persist into the future. So you've got these weird temporalities going on, where people people in the in, in the 21st century in the 2020s. Are living with and accommodating themselves to a, 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 a place that was an, was, an, was an imagined conception of the future 50 years ago. And so you've got this really odd sort of temporality of, the, of, of spatial planning that means that dreams of the future persist in the present as kind of leg legacies of the past. And that and that's a really important kind of way or thing to think about when you're thinking precisely about the legacies of spatial planning and the fact that they exist in the landscape and therefore um, they, they need to be negotiated with. And um, it's interesting, you know, it's an interesting question to debate the extent to which um, the post-war spatial planning, I mean, I want to do territory, I was a failure. And, and um, I, I, I think the overriding, the, the, one's overriding impression is that, it, the, 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 that it, at one level it certainly was a failure because it produced the kinds of environments that have dominated our thinking about post-colonial France and about the inequalities and, and the spatial, you know, the distribution of inequality in space. So particularly the kind of the, 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 the peripheral, you know, the Cité and the, and the Grand Ensemble and the, and the, uh, and, and the, the urban peripheries. Um, but I think what's interesting is the fact that they coexist with these elements of modernity that in their own terms probably were reasonably successful. So Sergi Pontoise was reasonably successful on its own terms. And then France's position within a European space has actually 
being kind of well served by some of these infrastructural projects. But, but that's one of the things I look at towards the end, the, the, towards the end of the book, when, 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 and I touched on it just towards the, end, towards the end of the paper, when you've got this coexistence of um, different, different spatial forms and, and different consequences of modernization. So you've got the persisting problem of the Grand Ensemble and, and, the, and the Quartier, and the fact that that problem, problem just keeps recurring. Um, and then you, 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 but it's coexisting around um, these other attempts to kind of re, re-prosecute modernity or post-war modernity through things like the Grand Paris project, which ultimately does nothing but kind of take the ideas of the Chemin de Acteur and, and, and rework them, really, but with, with, from a neoliberal kind of within a neoliberal framework, I suppose. But but uh, so, so 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 the dynamics that are set off in the sixties and seventies and eighties kind of really kind of reverberate through up to the present day. What's interesting if you if you take something like the the, the Notre Dame des Landes, um, which was the occupation of the site for the proposed airport just outside of uh, Nantes, um, so, uh, a, a quick parenthesis on that. One of the one of the legislative measures that the government brought in in the sixties was the what they called the the zone of deferred development, zone d'aménagement déféré, déféré. So um, the idea that you could expropriate land, put it into store, ready for a future project, which is which is how the Notre Dame des Landes project comes about. So they 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 put land in, they zad land uh, with the idea of building an airport there, and of course then. Um, when the protesters occupy the site to prevent the airport being built, they turn it, they call it a zone à défendre. And, and they, they proceed with a very, very interesting kind of social experiment of an alternative kind of communal way of life. And I think what's interesting about that debate, and it's kind of just really still playing out, is the fact that in the current context, the kind of the current kind of climate crisis context, what you see there is, is the way in which still within France, within kind of the French government and French thinking, there is this persistent idea of uh, modernization, you know, progress as modernization and growth. So that, 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 that the, 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 the model that hasn't really changed and is carried over certainly from the post-war period, but probably from beyond that, that equation between modernization and progress and economic development. And what the ZAD at Notre Dame des Landes does is really quite in a quite sustained way, an arguably quite successful way. It's probably one of the most successful attempts to really challenge that model, that paradigm, that paradigm of economic and development through modernization. And, and, and the fact that the, the Zadists were actually relatively successful in, in well, they, they were successful in fending off the airport, number one. They were also relatively successful in ensuring that there was sufficient space given to them to, to, to run their affairs in the way they liked it, suggests that maybe there, there is a, existing within the French territory, there is some sort of sense of an alternative model. Now, the problem is that politically, the political balance of power is such that, um, that, that, that at the moment, the French state has too much to lose to, to acknowledge or to recognize that alternative way of being, you know, too, too, too much bound up in, 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 in the, the, the dominant paradigm. But, but I think to answer your question in terms of where things stand now, I, I think the climate, the, the climate context, the climate crisis, and, and the protests that are, that are emerging out of that do mean that those paradigms are being challenged. And that will be one context in which it's happening, the, 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 the Notre Dame des Landes uh, context. When we look at something like the, the Gilets jaunes protests, which were disruptive of infrastructure and, and, and understood instantly that if you are to kind of take command of space, the places that you go to are the roundabouts and the junctions and the infrastructural kind of points of sensitivity. That's a different form of resistance um, that, 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 that is kind of in a way pursuing a different sort of logic because the concern there is cost of living. The, the trigger was tax on petrol. Uh, which was a green measure, of course, but of course, in a context where you've got a population that's, that's a rural population that's struggling with cost of living and struggling to survive, then taxing pe petrol, taxing diesel is really going to hit them. So that's a different form of political resistance that shows, I think, at the same time, the struggle over French space and French territory that's being played out. I hope that answers. Oh, yeah, the point. yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. 
So we're, we're getting on uh, on time, but um, I see the people slowly peeling off to, to, to go elsewhere. But I wanted to give the last opportunity to Enrico, my colleague in Italian, who posted a question in the chat. Enrico, if you're still here, you want to just ask your question and then we'll wrap up. If not, I can ask it. Or I'm not sure. enough still here. Oh, there it is. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting. You know, I was I, you very very rich talk. I was I was thinking uh, similar along similar lines in Italy. I was reflecting on uh, similar lines in Italy. So um, when they were building motorways in the same way, infrastructures in the same kind of same way, uh, more or less in the same years. And um, I was thinking of a movie like Il Sorpasso, Easy Life, uh, where there is this uh, ending with the people uh, Jean Louis Trintignant. Mm -hmm. who ends up off a cliff after riding on the road on a road trip to from the, from Rome to the coast uh, but also I was thinking about uh, following up on several of the things that have been said if there was an American mobility model uh, and I'm thinking in terms of how you know capital this uh, neo, neo capital this uh, creation of space along uh, David Harvey if there was the model that was followed especially maybe also within um, kind of um, gas stations because as you said right now in the last uh, um, answer you provided that we, petrol gas was was part of this issue uh, 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 and and there was there were also gas stations along the the motorways they were so just think if there was an American model and I, that's it thank you Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm thinking you've got me thinking about gas stations. You've got me thinking about gas stations actually. Um, and the funny, th the funny thing is that the funny thing is that gas stations don't necessarily always kind of feature in this. It's almost like they don't. It's almost like they don't want to reveal the kind of uh, the motive force behind it. You know, the the, the DS going down the motorway. It, it's kind of like kind of it wafts along on its own sort of essence, really. I suppose. Um, to what, to what extent is there, is, is, there, is, there, is there an American kind of is there an American model in play? I, I mean, I, I think thinking about some of the material. I, I mean, the the, 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 ro the road trip side of things is quite important in um, a lot of the material I look at, in quite a lot of the films I look at, in particular, the idea of the movement and the circulation. And the Blier films are quite good on this, actually. Bertrand Blier. You know, I mean, he, he's 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 got people kind of moving around quite a lot, bouncing around in space. But the actual fact, one of the ones that occurs to me um, is is the Corneau film Série Noire, where um, he, he tends to always return to the same place in that film, the, the lead, the, the, the central character, and where he returns to his wasteland. And so, and there, there is quite an interesting dialogue going on in, in, around this time between spaces of modernization, spaces of modernity, and the kind of the frontier model. You know, the idea of motorways as motorways and, 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 and freeways as, as freedom, and wasteland as this kind of repository of something. But it's not always clear what it's a repository of, other than not the kind of the super directed space of uh, space of the freeway. Um, but I think that goes back to what one of the things I was talking about earlier, which is this sense that the planners had that, that the French, are psych in some sense, the, the French are psychologically ill-adapted ill to the nature of modernity, which is kind of quite interesting, which is, so, so, so America's always there as a kind of, as a, as a place on the horizon and almost in a way, a lot kind of a model of good practice, quote unquote. Um, but 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 the French never quite live up to that particular dream, even though even though even though the the, 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 the state tries to create or engineer the the, the ability for them to do so. Um, yeah, that wasn't that was a, that was a rather dickuzu answer to your question, I'm afraid. Well, it is. That's great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, it's 11.30. Uh, if there are any more questions, feel free to speak up now. Otherwise, maybe we could all thank Ed for his wonderful talk. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you around in person or online sometime soon. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. And thank you for the questions. It was a, it was a very, very stimulating uh, set of questions that were asked. So thank you very much.
And thanks to Ari for inviting me again. It's been great. Thanks, Ed.